Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 16, titled, Talking to Those Who Depart Through Death. Greetings. Uh, This is uh, my little contribution to helping Nepal. Of course, I've sent some money, according to my ability, and our Tibet House U.S. in New York has also sent something, and we have encouraged our board members who have also sent And naturally, everybody's doing whatever they can. But I thought, and I can't go over there. They don't even want so many people over there. They're doing their best, and they have a lot of help. But of course, not really as much as they need. And there may be as many as 70,000 homes that have to be rebuilt. And there are hundreds of thousands homeless. And uh, they can't rebuild them in a sloppy way like they were, because the next earthquake could come at any time and knock them down. So... I can't help materially, but I thought this there is something that perhaps some of you might enjoy and it might you might get the get the drift of what I would like to offer in this short uh, video, which is taking care of the dead. How and there are other ways of doing it and I might do other ones, but this particular one I'm just going to use my translation of the Book of the Dead, so called Book of the Dead, which isn't really the Book of the Dead. It's mistitled by uh some kind of um, mistaken uh, business based on uh, their, their translator, first translator in the 30s. He was familiar with the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and he thought he would do that. But, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is based on the Buddhist insight that there are no dead people. People die, which is like going through a doorway super quick, like falling asleep, and then they wake up in a dream, and then they wake up back in a life, in another life and in another body. So they don't stay dead, like there's no state of dead, if you follow me. It's just a transition. So it's, it's actually called the Book of Liberation through hearing or learning in the between state. So liberation by hearing in the between is the short title of it, not Book of No Dead. Okay? So I'm going to talk, so, so what we do now is we imagine together, and when you hear of a disaster, it's a comforting thing to do for you, and you never know, and especially if a lot of people could do it, sending a vibration, not just, oh, how horrible and how disgusting and ah, you know, like this, adding to the freak out, but realizing that the people who got killed are the ones freaking out in their dreamlike between-body state. They're no longer freaking out about it. Of course, there are some trapped and that not everybody should be trying to save their lives, of course. But there are some who have already gone from the body. The connection is severed by death, which is what it is. Death is a severance. And they're freaking out like, what has happened to me? Where am I? They're in a dream state, which could become a nightmare, or it could become a beautiful dream, and it could lead to a beautiful rebirth, or an unfortunate rebirth by coming out of a nightmare. So, like when you wake up after a nightmare in an unhappy way, but of course, in ordinary life, you're still in your own body. Whereas there, the unhappy way might be an unhappy body. So, in the in Buddhist evolutionary theory, karmic theory, that means karma means evolution. So, so imagine that there are these hundreds of tens of thousands of souls in the case of the Nepali earthquake, who are in the between state now. They died maybe a week ago, three days, five days. I forget now how long back was the actual earthquake. And um, 25th, 6th, something like that. I can't remember, maybe two weeks. And they're still floating around like that, some of them. And so let's read together. And then you imagine that you're there in the together with the presence. Now, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in Muhammad, if you believe in Allah, if you believe in in uh, God or Jehovah, if you're Jewish or Buddhist or Christian, or if you're Krishna, then you can do that. If you're Buddhist, you can do Tara or Avalokiteshvara. And just imagine that your consciousness is hovering 
along with these loving, powerful, angelic beings, whose job it is in this subtle plane to sort of interact with the dreams, dreamlike between state of these beings and guide them toward positive experiences and learning in the between and for and liberation, but or if they can't achieve that liberation right away because they're so focused on worrying about where they're going, then at least a good rebirth. And so you think of that, and first we discuss the time of actual dying, where they go, and you say, hey, noble one, you can say, you named so-and-so, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Nepali, or young youth, youth boy or girl Nepali, Tibetan, or foreign Westerner, uh, who has just now left your body due to the horrendous circumstance of the earthquake. Um, now the time has come for you to seek the way. Just as your breath stops, the objective clear light of the first between will dawn, as previously described to you by your teacher or by what you studied about the process of death, where you go down through a series of moonlit, sunlit, and dark spaces, seeming unconsciousness into seeming unconsciousness, and then you come out into this amazing state of trans transparent, like a diamond-like translucency that's not bright and dazzling, nor is it dark and obscuring. It's just complete, crystal clear, midway between dark and light, no shadows. Everything is self-luminous. It's a marvelous, apparently marvelous place. But when you subjectively experience that, it means that you, have, you are in the process of trans, you have transited out your soul continuum, which always changes, it's not a fixed thing, always with your name and dog tag on it. It's a, just a constantly changing thing, but it is a consciousness process. And it has transited out of that body, and it is now in a state of not knowing what it is in a way. Like, like when you're in a dream, you don't really know what your body is like. And you kind of assume it's like the body you had when you were awake. Your outer breath stops, and you experience reality, stark and void like space. Your immaculate, naked awareness dawning clear and void without horizon or center. At that instant, you yourself must recognize this as yourself. You must stay with that experience. And I will describe it again to you in that moment. This is just before someone dies, when they die peacefully. And in this case, you're talking to someone who's already passed away. And then you prepare again that person by saying, by describing to them the eight signs. Now the mirage you see is the sign of earth dissolving in water. The smoke you see is the sign of water dissolving into the fire. And they, they, the person sees it in an inner space. They don't see it with their ordinary eyes. The mirage is the last of their ordinary visual uh, optic nerves uh, functioning. These fireflies of the swarming are the sign of fire dissolving into wind. This candle flame is the sign of wind dissolving into consciousness. This moonlit sky is the sign of consciousness dissolving into luminance. This sunlit sky is the sign of luminance dissolving into radiance. This dark sky is the sign of radiance dissolving into imminence. This pre-dawn twilight sky is the sign of dis imminence dissolving into clear light transparency. And that's the sort of diamond crystal clear light space. And so then you... So that's to prepare the person, but now I'm going to read this more meditatively and I'm not going to explain. And this is what I would hope maybe you can join me in meditating, if you want to play this again. And we meditate that we're hovering over the Kathmandu Valley. And of course, we don't know what to do, really. We're just ordinary people. We're just, it's our prayer. And we are kind of just lending our energy to empower the angels of love and compassion and the deities of love and compassion to help these poor souls to find their way to a better life. In, and prefer, ideal is human life or heaven, you know, where they can rest for a while. Human life is where they can evolve most effectively according to the Buddhist tradition. But heaven is fine. But they, of course, in those traditions that teach that heaven is a final thing and that's end, of course, we, evolutionarily speaking, we kind of don't agree with that. We also do not, of course, agree to materialists who think this is unnecessary because they just all cease to exist. They're all extinct. You know, they're extinguished and they're in oblivion and that we don't agree with that either. So we're in the middle between that, you know, sort of more close to the religious ones, 
but not completely ignoring the evolutionary ones. Just not allowing anything to become nothing. Nobody gets to be nothing. That's our point. Okay, now let's meditate this together, okay? Hey, noble one. And you say the name of, if you know a specific person, you say the name. Now you have arrived at so-called death. So you should conduct yourself according to your conception of the spirit of enlightenment, of love and compassion for all beings. You should conceive your spirit of enlightenment thus, thinking to yourself, Alas, I have arrived at the time of death. From now, relying on this death, I will develop my spirit only by contemplating the conception of the spirit of enlightenment, of love and compassion. For the sake of the whole space full of beings, I must attain perfect Buddhahood to be able to help them. End quote. And especially you should think, now for the sake of all beings, I will recognize the death clear light as the body of truth, the Buddha's body of truth, that is. Within its experience, I will attain the supreme accomplishment of the great seal, the great embrace, where being one with the entire universe in the body of truth, all differentiated phenomena are embraced lovingly by me and embrace me lovingly. That's the body of the great seal, the accomplishment of the great seal. It's like I and all others are all sealed together in a blissful embrace. And I will accomplish the purposes of all beings. As an enlightened being, I can accomplish their purposes. Think that because you will know how they feel and what they need and what they want and you will provide it to them. If I don't attain that, then in the time of the between, I will recognize it at the, as the between. So that's one big thing. Send the vibe to those who have died. Hey guys, stop freaking out and regretting that you're not on this street or in that house or with those people. You have died and you are in the between. And it's key that you maneuver there and make the best of that environment that you now are in. I will recognize it as the between. I will realize that between as the great seal body of communion where I, or rather you, those of you who have passed, will feel in communion with all enlightened beings, all divine beings, all angelic beings. You are really one person with all of them and therefore you're going to be all right because they are all right. They are all right alive, they are all right through death, any number of them, they are all right in a subtle between state. And I will accomplish the purposes of all the infinite space full of beings by manifesting whatsoever is needed to educate and help whomsoever, which is the Bodhisattva of great compassion is described as having that ability. Thus, never losing the willpower of that spiritual conception, you should remember the experience of whatever instructions you previously have practiced as a meditator in life. And now, in case someone died only within four, five, six days, this one last thing we read to them together. Because the key is, one of the things that is a key to helping someone find a freedom in the between state that is very difficult for an ordinary person who has never kind of let go of them, of their personality in a kind of transcending experience where they sort of open to the universe and lose the sense of separate self. Although every human being has that little bit, through, especially through love, when they love someone and they go out of themselves in the process of loving someone, sometimes in aesthetic experience at a concert or in a, in a museum and in in confronting a fantastic work of art, or sometimes in a sort of sleep, sleeping, waking state, they just have an amazing thing where they feel kind of very peaceful and happy in nature by the side of a lake on the top of a mountain, you know. People have this kind of self-transcending experiences. But basically, we feel a little uncomfortable sort of just being out there and not having being within our tight boundary and thinking we're in control of where we are and nothing bad is going to happen to me. And so we scramble for another form when we go into the vast space that we are introduced to through death, always. It's kind of, instead of taking it as an ecstatic, blissful self-transcendence, we take it as a, 
as a as as a loss, as a as a as a getting lost in space, and we freak out and scramble and try to gain traction on something and reassert our sense of separate identity. And so the key there is the instruction on how to experience the vastness as yourself, rather than feeling you have to defend yourself from it. That then liberates you not to be compulsively attached to adopting any particular form, like any kind of thing that will do, so anything that sort of flits into your awareness, you can jump into it. Instead of that, you feel fine, and, I, and then you can choose between different forms from a liberated condition. Hey, noble one, you named Bob, or Akil, or Ajit, or Ajay, whatever. Listen here. Now the pure, clear light of reality dawns for you. Recognize it. Hey, noble one, this your present conscious, natural, clear light, void awareness. This presence in clear voidness, without any objectivity of substance, sign, or color. Just this is the reality, the Mother Buddha, all around goodness. And this, your conscious awareness, natural voidness, not succumbing to a false annihilative voidness, like, like you're just trying to be unconscious, escape from it by becoming unconscious. Just your own conscious awareness, unceasing, bright, distinct, and vibrant. Just this awareness is the Father, Buddha all around goodness. So the Mother Father Buddha is your consciousness expanding infinitely into infinite space, which is the Mother all around goodness Buddha. Just this presence of the indivisibility of your awareness as naturally in substantial voidness, and the vibrant, bright presence of your conscious awareness. Just this is the Buddha body of truth. Your awareness thus abides in this vast mass of light, of clarity, void, indivisible. You are free of birth or death. Just this is the Buddha changeless light. It is enough just to recognize this. Recognizing this, your own conscious awarenesses, purity nature as the Buddha, yourself beholding your own awareness, that is to dwell in the inner realization of all Buddhas. So this is a kind of a way in which you actively uh, address whoever you know or can imagine as having just died in order to reassure them when they feel themselves melting and dissolving into the vastness. And because otherwise the danger, as I said, is that they will rush off into any kind of corner just to feel that they're sort of in some sort of secure place. Because they're used to that in their, in their differentiated and separated uh, coarse body that they've been living in for some period of time. And by the way, you always call them all noble one. And why even they were ordinary person, but you call them noble because anyone who is a human is relatively speaking noble. Because the human embodiment evolutionarily comes from the long karmic evolutionary development, life after life, soul embodiment after soul embodiment, in coarse body after coarse body, in all animal forms and all divine forms and demonic forms, in the infinite beginningless past. And to come to the human form is to come to a form that is naturally highly interdependent and interconnectable. Born in a womb, helpless for decades, dependent upon the kindness of strangers, parents, and although then they become parents, and also interlocking with others to reproduce and so forth, and uh, embracing others tenderly and so on. And that's a kind of really, that's a product of altruism, compassion, love, uh, being a loving type of being. So that means that humans have a nature of nobility, even though, of course, they're, they're tremendous intelligence and their tendency to be swept away by their limbic brain and their low, lower instincts, they can be very monstrous, naturally. But uh, that's why you address all of the beings, human beings, who are being reborn in that way. And also don't neglect the dogs and cats and mice and 
rats and whatever other animals were killed in the Nepali disaster and try to steer them toward humanity. In the subtle form, people can change embodiment very dramatically if they have the right inspiration and the right template offered and presented to them. Okay? So anyway, that's, that's a little taste of the book of natural liberation through hearing in the between. And I'm doing it not to just to brainwash you or anything. I'm doing it in case you want, you have some way that you would like to aim your prayers for the beings who have died in Nepal, in addition to whatever physical and material help you are giving and other kinds of prayers you are invoking the enlightened beings or the divine beings to do. And this is a way of sort of having closer, feeling closer to those people and to their situation. And believe me, if millions of us do that, it will have an impact on those people. Because it's like, when you imagine something, your subtle mind is sort of in going into the area of other beings' subtle minds. Okay? Thank you very much. All the best.